Good morning, everyone. A very warm welcome to our Sunday service here at Emmanuel Church and also to those online who are watching locally and further afield. Welcome to everyone. Now, on Tuesday, it will be a year since we went into lockdown. And as we know, lots of people have lost friends and relatives to the coronavirus. And for those people, and indeed for those who have lost loved ones for any reason during these last 12 months, it's been even harder than it normally is. Because due to the social distancing rules, they've been unable to mourn in the usual way. So on Tuesday, there's a national call for us to keep a minute's silence at 12 noon to remember those that we have lost and their loved ones. And we're just going to watch a video about this. Now, church will be open at that time, 12 o'clock on Tuesday, if you feel that you would like to gather here for a short time of reflection and prayer and silence. And also, if you know someone who is bereaved, then maybe you could let them know that you're thinking of them and praying for them on that day. And Richard has put a link on our Emmanuel Church Facebook page, which has more information, including a downloadable PDF postcard, which you can send to someone. Okay, the other notices. Richard's Piano Soiree on Friday evening is at 7pm on the Friends of Tab's Facebook page. The evening will be called Here Comes the Spring. That's a lovely title, isn't it? And any requests for tunes that you want Richard to play, can you get them to him as soon as possible, please? Next Sunday is Palm Sunday, and that's the beginning of Holy Week. And Barbara Bancroft and Richard have put together some wonderful um, Holy Week bags for us all to use as uh, reflections during that week. And they are going to be delivered to everyone in, in our members of our church and community. But if you're here this morning in person, could you please collect one at the back, but tell Barb Bancroft over there that you've got one so that she can tick you off the list. Not tick you off, but tick you off the list. <laughs> and uh, yeah. she ticks me off, but don't you. <laughs> so she can, she can cross you off the list so that she doesn't give you two. Uh, on Monday, Thursday of that week, um, there'll be a short service. And if it's fine, it'll be in the garden uh, at 6 p.m. If it's not fine, we'll be having it in church. And then on Good Friday, we'll be having our usual hour by the cross at 2 p.m. And then on the Easter days, there'll be Easter communions at Barmston at half past nine and Emmanuel at 11. So all are welcome to come to that. <coughs> Now, I've been told it's Daphne Pierce's birthday tomorrow. She's one of our online worshippers. Happy birthday, Daphne. Are there any other birthdays? No, just Daphne then, Richard. Can we sing? Daphne. 
Right, let's begin with our opening prayer. Let's go into our time of worship. And we say together, we have come, come to get... Pardon? Sorry? We say together, we have come together as the family of God in our Father's presence to offer him praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive his holy word, to bring before him the needs of the world, to ask his forgiveness of our sins, and to seek his grace, that through his Son, Jesus Christ, we may give ourselves to his service. Amen. We're now going to stand and hum or sing at home, praise to the holiest in the height. Let's stand. Please be seated. Now, this is the time in our service where we bring to God all the things that we've done <clears throat> or said that we shouldn't have, and also things that we've not done or said that we should have. And we say versions of this prayer on our Sunday services every week, don't we? And sometimes, if we're not careful, it can become a habit that we just take for granted as being just a regular part of the service. And as I was praying yesterday, I was reminded that in our morning prayer group that we have on WhatsApp Monday to Friday at 10 o'clock, we use the Northumbria community Celtic prayers. And the opening sentences speak of actively seeking God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and asking him to have mercy on us. So I thought that before we say our prayer of penitence, if you, if you can, we could close our eyes 
and seek the face of Jesus. And imagine that we're standing in front of him and we're holding a big black bin liner in our hands. And let's seek him with all our heart for the times that we've hardened our hearts to him. We've let the, the desires of our hearts lead us away from God's purpose for our lives. And we put those in the bag. Now let's seek him with all our souls when we've not lived as redeemed or saved people. We've lived in fear. We've let fear, anger, resentment, selfishness, unforgiveness rule in our lives. <clears throat> and we failed to extend the grace that we have received from God. We've ex failed to extend it to others. And we put that in the bag. Now let's seek him with all our mind. And we need a really big bag for this. Because I think that this is the biggest tool that the enemy uses to distract us from the purposes that God has for us. Because every action begins with a thought. The times we've allowed our minds to stray to places we shouldn't go. We failed to ask Jesus to protect our minds. And we put that in the bag. And now let's seek him with all our strength. Jesus says, come to me all you who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke and learn from me. How many times have we thought we knew better and tried to do things in our own strength? And we all know how that turned out, don't we? So we put those in the bag. Now give the bag to Jesus. Don't take anything out of it before you give him it. Let him tie it up. And don't try to go back for it later. And then see him throw it into the deepest ocean and then he puts up a sign, no fishing. He's taken them away forever. And with that in mind, now let's open our eyes and say together the prayer of penitence. <clears throat> Excuse me. Father, we have sinned against heaven and against you. We are not worthy to be called your children. We turn to you again. Have mercy on us. Bring us back to yourself as those who once were dead, but now have life through Christ our Lord. Amen. May Almighty God, who sent his Son into the world to save sinners, bring us his pardon and peace now and forever. Amen. Now Denise is going to come up and give us her testimony. Morning, everybody. Um, I'd like to speak to you about how Jesus has been in my life, and the Lord gave me a memory when I was just three years old, not so long ago, so I'll just mention it. Um, my sister, she took me to the next street, to this, um, this big hut, and... Um, and I must have said, well, what, where's this? And she said, oh, it's the, the Gospel Hall. So um, I didn't remember much about it, but only the name of it. But I must have liked it because the following week, I toddled off myself, and I was only three. And I remember getting there, and there was this great big corrugated iron door, which I couldn't open. And then I looked up, and there was this big man, he looked huge, and he opened the door for me. And I don't remember anything about the meeting, I just remember that. And getting back home, and all the street were out, my mum and all the neighbours, and she says, where have you been? So I says, well, 
I've been to Gospel Hall and she didn't, I didn't get into trouble because I was only a little kid, wasn't I? And, um, but um, that brought to, to mind, she said, we were very sick, we wondered where you are, but I didn't get into trouble. And um, it brings to mind that when Jesus was missing and his parents um, said, you know, and he said to them, um, we didn't, you know, I'd be in my father's house. So that reminds me of that. And anyway, my, I've got three lovely sisters. The same sister, she got a beautiful Bible when she was 12. It had all pictures of Jesus in, and it zipped up, and it were in a lovely box. So I says to my dad, I said, um, when, I 12, when I'm 12, can I have a Bible? And he said, it's just a waste of money. You'll, you won't read it. Anyhow, I got my Bible when I was 12. And I did read it, but I didn't understand it at the time. And um, my dad were a poorly man. And when he was poorly, my mum used to, I used to have to stay in the bedroom. My mum made a fire for him in the bedroom. And I remember one day running from school and getting my Bible and sitting down and reading to him. And I remember I read, it must have been Chronicles or something, because all, all I read was, and so-and-so begat so-and-so, and so-and-so begat so-and-so. So it kind of made him feel much better, but I knew that Jesus made people better, so I knew that he'd heal my dad, and he did. So, like I said, my dad was a very poorly man, and when I was 19, he, um, he was taken into hospital with pneumonia, and he didn't come on. And um, I was heartbroken because my dad was my best friend. And because my mum had gone deaf when I was a little girl. And he used to talk to me, my dad, about all personal things and that. Anyway, I went to see him at Chapel of Rest with my mum. And I just looked and I saw, well, that's just a body. Where's my dad gone? He was a beautiful pianist, you know. And I thought, I just don't know where he's gone. We used to share a a penny chew out with you. I used to break it with poker and, and share a penny chew and I just couldn't understand where it had gone. And then not long after, my auntie died of lung cancer as well. And I just didn't, didn't know what was really going on. And um, anyway, I had my first little baby, Robert. And he was lovely. He brought us all joy. Made us all want to live again after my, my dad dying. And... Um, he bought trip furniture, he called me Mama. And um, he was so lovely, he brought us lots of joy. But they found out he'd got something wrong with his heart. And, and he went to be with the Lord. The Lord took him away when he was eight months. Well, um, I, just, I just didn't want to live anymore at that time. <laughs> I found it very difficult. And um, I remember waking up next day thinking, I could hear the birds singing the dawn chorus, and I thought, how can they sing so beautiful when my heart is breaking like this? But, um, I, like I say, I went through a bad time. I did manage to have more children. Praise the Lord. I had another two boys and a girl. But I always suffered from anxiety and depression. And my husband was dependent on drink as well. But we never went short, you know, the Lord always looked after us. He said, I will supply all your needs. And he did. Um, we were never short of furniture. We got furniture given, clothes given. The lady at the bottom shop, she sent potatoes, what people wouldn't buy. Um, little potatoes and green potatoes. But we were just, we never went short. The Lord always looked after us. Anyway, my anxiety and depression, a lot, uh, the, the doctors give me tablets to calm me down, to give me antidepressants, and nothing worked, nothing worked. And um, I developed agoraphobia, panic attacks and everything. And um, psychiatrists were involved, psychologists, to no avail. But this couple, elderly couple across the road called Edna and Alf, um, they befriended me. And when... Um, when I got the kids in bed, I used to go play Yahtzee with them. It's a dice game. Me and Roger play it now. <laughs> it's a good game. And um, they said to me, 
We're going to see Billy Graham tomorrow, Denise. Would you like to come with us? I didn't know who the Billy Graham were at the time, and I said, oh, I can't go, I don't go. Edna says, you know you'll be all right with us too, Denise. Come on. So I says, all right then. I didn't really want to go. <laughs> and little knowing what a change it was going to make in my life. <laughs> anyway, I was scared to go, really scared. But I managed to go, and when we got there, we were at Bramall Lane at Sheffield, and there were 3,000 people there. And I sat there and um, felt strange. And then when I started singing, you know, when we started singing, I felt all right, I felt at peace. And then we started singing, How Great Thou Art. And when it comes to that bit when it says, and when I think that God is son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. And this cut me in two. And then I could hear Billy Graham saying, if you died in a plane crash tonight, are you ready to meet your maker? And I thought, no, I'm not ready to meet my maker. I must go forward, I'm not ready. So I started walking forward. And although there were 3,000 people there, it just felt there were only me walking. It was like in slow motion, walking on holy ground, going to the front. And um, the choir was singing, O Lamb of God, I come. It was just like angels singing. And when I got to the front, everyone were crying. And I was crying. We were all being baptised in the Holy Spirit. What a wonderful experience. And I never, I never um, do anything about going home. All I remember is sitting on the bus with this lovely smile on my face, feeling so blissful. And um, after that, you had to go to meetings. And, uh, and I said to people, I hope I, I go to meetings because I hadn't learned to trust the Lord then. Um, I said, I don't go. But Will, the deacon of the church who had taken us there, he said, I'll pick you up, Denise, and um, I'll bring you back. So I managed to go to the meetings. But the Lord had sent Will because Will told me, he says, you know, you've got a Father in heaven that loves you just as much as your dad did. In fact, he loves you even more. He says, you can talk to him. Abba Father, you can say anything you want to him. So that is what I did. And then Wilf knew exactly what, I was, what I'd been going through because he'd had a nervous breakdown. And he told me about the scripture in um, Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. So this is what I used to say to myself when I was feeling fearful. And I've got this on my chimney breast now, a transfer. You know, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. And um, I went to these meetings, and then it was a Baptist church that I was going to, Hunslet Baptist Tabernacle in Leeds. And um, I took lessons for baptismal lessons. And... Um, I got baptised with my, it was a family baptism, my oldest son Carl and my daughter Diane, we all got baptised together. And um, my husband, who'd been dependent on drink, he started coming to church and then he got baptised. But the week after he'd got baptised and given his life to the Lord, he died of a heart attack. We were all shocked, but we were so, so um, thankful that he'd given his life to the Lord, so we knew he would be resting in peace. And then the Lord sent Roger into my life, and he's worked marvellous things for me and Roger, but I'll have to leave that for another time because he's done 
all sorts, there's all sorts to tell you. <laughs> Thank you for listening to me. May God bless you all. <laughs>
the name we honor. Jesus is the name we praise. Majestic name above all other names. The highest heaven and earth proclaim that Jesus is our God. group that was wonderful as usual could you please sit down thanks isn't it great how things work out with God we chose those songs weeks ago and yet they fitted perfectly into what Denise had said we had no idea what she was going to say it's just fantastic how God works so now we're going to have our Bible readings and the first one's going to be read by Sharon and the second one by Liz First reading today is taken from Hebrews 5, verses 5 to 10. In the same way, Christ did not, did not take on himself the glory of becoming a high priest, but God said to him, You are my son, today I have become your father. And he says in another place, You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. During the days of Jesus, his life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to, to the one who could save him, though he save him from death. And he was heard because, because of his reverent submission. Son, sorry. Son, though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered and once made perfect. He became, he, became, uh, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was designated by God to be high priest in order of Melchizedek. This is the word of the Lord.
Our second reading is from John's Gospel, chapter 12, beginning to read at verse 20. Jesus predicts his death. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honour the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Sharon and Liz. Now we're going to watch a video called The Great High Priest by Cameron Keith.
Good morning, everyone. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you reveal more about your Son, Jesus Christ, to each one of us today through your living word and by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, today doesn't disappoint, hasn't it been great? Over the last few weeks, hearing testimonies from members of our own congregation about how they've met with Jesus, how he's transformed and turned their lives around and answered prayers, and how each of those stories, each of those testimonies have been so different according to the person it was. It's not always been easy and often with doubts and sometimes it's been a long journey, but the lives have been and are still changing because they've met with the living Son of God, Jesus Christ, and invited him into their lives. And then the ripples have gone out, haven't they? Because of those testimonies, we've already heard that people are passing on that from person to person. And so there's more people beginning to think, hmm, wonder if I should meet with this person called Jesus. And I loved it when Rich spoke the other week about um, sudden transformations, conversion experiences for some people, like Paul on the road to Damascus, where there's blinding lights and he's suddenly thrown from his horse, etc., um, conversion experiences but often those we feel are very few and Rich spoke about the fact that some of us have more of a road to Emmaus type experience where we're actually coming along gently by other people coming alongside Jesus almost without really knowing it until at some point we actually realize whoa God's been doing this and leading me all this way and I think Denise's story was partly that that starting at the age of three and looking back she can now see how the path was being followed and both types of conversion are just as valid well today is the start of passion tide the real build up to Easter and the focus is now definitely on Jesus who he is and what's about to happen to him and in John's gospel where our reading came from today the triumphant entry into Jerusalem has already happened in the previous chapter. Our gospel reading today begins with some Greeks who'd come to Jerusalem for the Passover celebrations, asking Philip politely if they could see Jesus. These were perhaps people on the edge of Judaism who've heard about Jesus and want to talk with him for themselves. Maybe they'd witnessed Jesus' miracles, healings, teachings, and wanted to ask him questions. Maybe, because they were Greeks, maybe they wanted to ask him, are we included? Is all this for us too, or is it just for the Jews? They wanted to see Jesus. Now, we don't know, but it's thought likely that they might have approached Philip because he's got a Greek name. And so they felt happier of asking him and approaching him. And that often happens in our lives too, doesn't it? That we feel happier approaching someone who's like us. You can see that Jesus is at work in their lives and we think, hmm, well, if it can work for them, then maybe, maybe it can work for me too. It's intriguing that Philip then doesn't go straight off to Jesus himself, but he finds Andrew and then together they find Jesus. And so often in our lives too, there's more than one person involved in the journey of us meeting with Jesus. It might be one person who planted a tiny seed many years ago. Another person who encourages that seed to begin to grow. And yet another one further down the line who's actually the person who actually gets to introduce that person to Jesus. It's all teamwork, working with God and listening to his spirit. Well, the Greeks have got their priorities right, haven't they, in saying, we would like to see Jesus, straight and to the point. We might think it was easier for them because they actually had Jesus in the flesh. They could actually see Jesus. Well, now the crunch is that other people seeing Jesus relies on us. Our lives, our buildings must speak of Jesus. Fortunately, God is amazing and can use even the most reluctant of us to speak to other people, which is just as well. And sometimes I think we need to remember when we're around church, we're doing things, we're busy doing activities, that there are people who will come in seeking Jesus. 
And we kind of divert them sometimes, don't we, into, oh, would you like to come and help us clean this or do this or be part of this committee or that committee? And they're thinking, well, I wanted to see Jesus. And we say, oh, well, eventually, yes, eventually, but do this first. On the other hand, that kind of way suits some people. But actually, some people feel happier coming and offering, like we've had with the help for the homeless meal. Some people feel happier coming and offering to help with that and then find that God leads them to meet with Jesus through that. In today's reading, Jesus starts by saying that the Son of Man is going to be glorified, praised to the highest degree possible. That must have sounded so good to the audience. They'd seen him enter Jerusalem. They'd all been shouting Hosanna and praising him and rejoicing him. Yes, time to celebrate. We have a new leader. Praise him indeed. Well, Jesus very quickly focuses their minds. Time's running out. And he focuses their minds onto life, death, and what's going to happen to him very soon. And he gently brings them in by beginning starting with an example from everyday life for them, talking about that grain of wheat falling into the ground, something really familiar to them, that that grain of wheat dies to itself, is seen no more, but it produces a root and then a shoot and eventually a head of grain full of seeds. So one seed has in fact become many. Through that one death of that one seed, many more live on. And so then, and it multiplies and multiplies. That sound familiar? That through Jesus' death, many more will become followers. And the authorities had hoped and thought, yep, we've killed Jesus, end of problem. Little did they know. Saying earlier, it's like someone, if you're gardening and you've got a garden, you take over a garden or an allotment and it's full of cooch grass. And you look at it and think, oh, I can't start doing that bit by bit. Oh, get a rotivator. That'll sort it all out. You plow up and down with the rotivator. And you think, yes, done it, sorted. And you come back a few weeks later and think, oh, my goodness, there's even more grass now than there was in the beginning. Because each of those bits of the root of cooch grass becomes a new little plant. So you've just multiplied the problem. And that's, in fact, what the Jewish authorities had done. They'd killed off Jesus, thought, yes, that's it now. We can sit back, relax, enjoy Passover. And then they must have been horrified at all these people popping up who are going to spread the news even more fervently and determinedly. Well, seeing Jesus is not just a spectator sport. And it isn't always easy and comfortable Jesus warns them and us too that we have to be willing to give up our lives. Following Jesus is not for the faint-hearted. Just something to reflect on as we approach Holy Week. Would we, are we, or have we been willing to give up everything to follow Jesus? In many countries today, people are still being killed for following Jesus. And in the past, many missionaries have given their lives in order to sow the seeds to spread the good news about Jesus. But just as Jesus rose from the dead and is alive today, we are promised new life while we're on earth and also eternal life when we die. And Jesus goes on to state that he's going to be lifted up as he was on the cross at Calvary for us taking our place and dying to set us free from our sins, the ultimate and perfect sacrifice. He also reminds us that he'll draw all men to himself, not just the Jews, and that must have been so encouraging to the Greeks that were listening, trying to seek him, that they too can see Jesus. All people can come and see Jesus. And he would also be lifted up from death in his resurrection, in his rising again. And then again, when he went up into heaven, we celebrate on Ascension Day. Now, the reading from Hebrews affirms that Jesus is both a king, who is a priest, the son of God who suffered, 
wept and died as a fully human being. Now, Jesus wasn't a descendant of Aaron and so wouldn't qualify for Jewish priesthood under the law of Moses. As we're told today, Jesus was to be a priest in the order of Melchizedek, who, if we look back into the depths of Genesis, in chapter 14 and verse 18, we discover gets a very brief mention when he blesses Abraham. And if you want to read more about Melchizedek, then in Hebrews chapter 7, you'll find that Paul spends a lot of time going over Melchizedek and the importance of it and how it relates to Jesus. So there's some bedtime reading for you. Hebrews chapter 7. Now Melchizedek was in fact both king and priest, just like Jesus was to be. His name actually means king of righteousness, and he was also king of Salem or Jerusalem, which means king of peace. Again, the little bits falling into place, the link to Jesus. And I just love it when you look back into the Old Testament and something buried away there actually is really significant in the New Testament and the gospel message. It's amazing that you know, all those bits of the puzzle were all being planned all those years before and all coming into place. We've been talking about seeds being planted and growing. We need to remember that some seeds are really quick and easy to grow, aren't they? Hands up if you've grown crest seeds at school at some point when you didn't experiment. Yeah, instant growth, really good for doing things like that. Others take a long time. And some even need cold, harsh conditions to grow. Some of the pine trees and things like that actually need to go through hard winter and snow to, in order to germinate them and begin to grow. And I used to love trying to grow all sorts of seeds, whether it's peanuts or lemons or oranges, all sorts. My windowsill used to be full of all these things growing. And probably following that, somebody brought me a banana seed as a Christmas present. Now, if you've ever tried to grow a banana seed, I don't recommend this. Not unless you've got one of those nice modern little heated propagators on a timer switch now, which would be very useful. But I didn't have one of those, and the instructions were that this wonderful banana seed needed to spend 19 hours in a cool condition, and then five hours in somewhere really warm, like the airing cupboard. So faithfully, every day, I was meant to move this thing, put it in the airing cupboard, and put it back. And then I probably did that for perhaps a week, maybe two weeks. <laughs> and then kind of if you forgot one evening, you thought, oh, it's had so many, <laughs> not quite those right many hours. Thought, mm, is this thing actually ever going to grow? And then I read on the instructions and it said, might take two or three months. I thought, oh, that's it, that's it. I'm not that bothered about seeing whether a banana seed will grow or not. And some seeds begin to grow years and years later, don't they? We've heard where thousands of years later you can actually manage to germinate seeds and they grow. Well, just like the seeds, some people become Christians really quickly. They're just ready and they become Christians as soon as they hear about Jesus. Others, it might take a traumatic event, the death of someone close to them, to actually trigger they're questioning what's it all about. And sometimes people just take a long time and patience for bit by bit, word by word, that they actually meet with Jesus. We're all different and it's in God's timing, not ours. It's no good trying to force somebody, you know, if they're a seed that takes cold, harsh conditions to grow, it's no good saying, oh, I'll shove you in some warm conditions and that'll be really good for you and it'll speed it up, because it won't. And as I said, we're at the start of Passion Tide. And if we're not careful, as Easter approaches, we can come next Sunday and celebrate on Palm Sunday, wave our palm leaves. We would be singing normally, but we can hum loudly. Those of you at home can sing as loudly as you like. And then we'd come again perhaps on Easter Sunday and celebrate Jesus rising from the dead and being alive today. And we'd fall into the trap of thinking that it's all about celebrations and that our lives should be as Christians, all rosy and celebratory. 
we actually need to journey through with Jesus through the painful and sometimes stormy events of Holy Week. Him turning over the tables in the temple, the anointing of him, the Last Supper, being with him in the painful heart-wrenching prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, being betrayed by a friend, tortured, mocked, suffering death on the cross, in the eerie silence of the tomb, all before Easter morning and the celebrations. So, as Jackie mentioned earlier, we have put together a Holy Week bag. So please make sure that you get yours before you go. And yes, you're quite right, Jackie, I do need to make sure that we know who's got them and who hasn't, so we don't take them round to your house and find that you've already got one there. Inside is a leaflet which takes you through, day by day, Holy Week, and for each day there is an object in there to help you focus your prayers and thoughts, and you will need a Bible as well to follow some of the readings. And this, when you get to Easter Sunday, yes, there is a cream egg in there. So please make sure that you get yours to take home and help, help follow Holy Week. So let's just be, let's be like those Greeks, eager and hungry to meet with Jesus, either to start ourselves off on that journey or to deepen our relationship with him, this passion tide. Let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you that as we look around outside and see the sunshine opening up the buds and the blossom and seeing new life sprouting forth, we just thank you that as we approach Easter, help us to go on that journey with Jesus through the low times, through the hard times, but then to come to that resurrection day of joining with you. We just pray that you guide and lead and accompany each of us for all of our journeys will be so different and you have something different to say to each one of us. So speak to us by the power of your Holy Spirit and through your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. You, Barbara that was wonderful I really feel that God's well he's always present here isn't he but I feel he's really present this morning in a powerful way I hope you do too so let's stand and declare our faith in our faithful God let us declare our faith in God we say together we believe in God the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with power from on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I also hope that people watching online are feeling the same things that we are this morning. And if you are, please share it with us. We're now going to sing a Graham Kendrick song, Thank You for the Cross.
Thank you, Jesus, for the cross. Now Rich is going to come and lead us in prayer. The collect for the fifth, the collect for the fifth Sunday of Lent. Gracious Father, you gave up your Son out of love for the world. Lead us to ponder the mysteries of his passion, that we may know eternal peace through the shedding of our Saviour's blood, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now today, the Diocese of York launch a big initiative called Children of Light, where they want to make children a priority for the whole year in churches across the diocese, because as we know, children's and youth work in churches has really suffered so with our prayers today we'll be thinking about children in our community and in our world jesus took a little child whom he placed among them taking the child in his arms he said to them whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me and whoever welcomes me does not welcome me but the one who sent me Let's close our eyes and think of a child in your family. The child is in your arms. Perhaps they're sitting on your knee or maybe you are cradling them. And so we pray. Father, we thank you for children. We thank you for how they bring out the best in us and how they make us smile. We treasure them and ask that you will cradle them in your arms and protect them under your wings. Bless our families and enrich our lives through the gift of children within our families. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In Deuteronomy it says, And you shall teach them diligently to your children and speak of them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Now let us think of the children in our community. Perhaps you might picture them as they walk to school in their colourful uniforms. Or you might imagine them here in church during one of the activities that took place before lockdown. And we pray. Jesus, we pray for a return of children to our churches. Fill us with compassion and equip us with skills to engage them in your message. Make our hearts break for the children in our town and motivate us to put children at the front and the centre of our ministry at Emmanuel. Remind us that children are the church of today and help us do all we can to bring them to worship. We also pray for the local schools. We ask that teachers might narrow the gaps that have built up over the last year. Be with all children, especially the most vulnerable. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Jesus said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. And now, perhaps you can think of a child in another part of God's kingdom, somewhere away from the UK. You might think of children in Mozambique. Save the Children this week reported how militants linked to the Islamic State have killed hundreds of children. Or you might think of the children of Uyghur Muslims in China who are living in orphanages after being taken from their families. Or you might think of those living in fear of war and violence in Yemen, Syria or Myanmar. And we pray. Lord, bring peace to your world. Bring your assurance to children waking up in fear this morning. Bring justice to those who harm or exploit children. Bring parents back together with their children. Help us to speak up for the rights of the voiceless. Give our world leaders the courage to intervene. Lord, in your mercy. And finally, we remember that the Bible tells us that we are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. 
And on Tuesday, there will be a national day of reflection to mark a year since the beginning of lockdown. As we are all children of God, let us now, in the silence of our hearts, bring before God our personal prayers and pains from the year past, aware that those pains may linger on. And if you are joining us online, you might comment in a moment of silence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we say together the words that our Father taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. On earth as in heaven, give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you so much, Rich, for those lovely prayers. And now we're going to sing our final song, and as usual, we've got some links going up online for the uh, for the giving virtual offering one for Barmston and one for Emmanuel and for us here in church we've got one a, a dish at the back of church for anyone that would like to leave something in there before they go and as usual we'd like to thank everybody for their generosity over the last 12 months we've uh, we're really thankful for that so our final song my song is love unknown Let's stand.
Let's say together, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.